instructions. It's pretty straightforward. If you're sitting next to somebody you already know, please move. <laughs> and discuss implies collaborative conversation. <laughs> okay, everyone who's coming in, look at the screen, please, and follow the instructions. Laptops, mic, mic, the lapel mic. That's all you have. You don't have a lapel. Okay, I can use that. That's fine. Testing. Thank you. So everybody coming coming in, please follow the instructions. It's pretty straightforward. Then you have a long effect of hair or UAD or second phase of the project and the second phase so at this point it does mean we expect every one of you to be engaging in a conversation with somebody else Yes. Yeah. Uh, probably ten minutes. Time, time check it. Time check it. Ten minutes. Because we do get carried away. <laughs> you are not engaged in the conversation <laughs> there are people behind you look behind you <laughs> Oh, we're it's going. Going. Uh, it's we're going. <laughs> if you're sitting quietly, you're not in a conversation. <laughs> we're done. Oh, they've solved all the problems with projects. We've found all the problems with projects. Cool, you've all been to an Agile conference before. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, folks. So, who here didn't have any problems with projects in that conversation? 
One, okay, you, you can leave. I, I don't think we have anything to teach you. <laughs> They've never done a project. Oh, even better. In that case, you also can leave because I don't think we have anything to teach you. All right, so who wants to share something that they, that they heard or that, that they told someone else about the challenges that they've been facing? I will just pick people at random if you don't want to nominate. Somebody over on the right. So the common problem that we have is regarding budgeting, where when we give the quotation based on the problems identified, we were, we were asked, why do you need a product owner? Why do you need a scrum master? Why can't we just have, instead of two FTE for web developers, why can't we just have half? Why do you need this? So that's, that's the common problem. Oh, yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm from Shell, and we work with other delivery organizations as well, right? So we're not alone doing this stuff. So we work with uh, you know, DXC, the Erstwell, HP, we work with Infosys, we work with various organizations, right? So just having that sort of synchronization in the way we deliver and then being able to deliver on time, scope, whatever is a big challenge. I. For my sins, I used to work for IBM, so I can, I can share that for the other side as well. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Anant. I am from Microfocus. So uh, our challenges are mainly to always catching up with the uh, customer demands, always struggling to <laughs> deliver on time, actually. Basically, expectations are higher. We are always one quarter behind, you know, in meeting expectations. Now, there was a couple in the back. You Shout it out. For the camera. For the camera. Okay, so uh, we actually, uh, we have a collaboration with uh, another company and we have a statement of work or scope of work, NRE kind of, uh, you know, projects we get. So even if we care for value over, uh, you know, like we care for priorities and uh, now we agree that we don't need to worry about deadlines, still there will be leftovers from the, so what do we do with, uh, with leftovers from NRE? Do we take it to the next one? So these are the challenges about scheduling and scoping. Uh, my question is, I'm a consultant, so we usually work with clients for certain durations, right? So when it's agile implementation or transformation. So whenever we go to client and give some quotation and as to this is what the time duration that we're going to work, but it's it's good that the client will not agree for like, you know, over a year, two years or three years, but they're going to give some duration as it's going to be like, okay, we'll get started with three months and then we see the progress and if it's working, then we're going to extend it or whatever the reason it is. My challenge over here is like, good grade that it's going to happen for first three months and so and things works and team sees the progress and everything but we are not sure that it's going to sustain because that's not the time duration that we tell the clients that it's going to be sustained so how could we make the management or the people the sponsors to realize that it's not going to sustain if you are signing a contract for three months or less sadly if i could answer that one i'd be a very very rich person one more? Okay. So, <laughs> we okay. so we don't empathize with the customers, right? So when we do projects, we, we are only focused on scope and this is what it is. And we see more of a business than empathizing with the customer, trying to understand what the customer is and then trying to build the product for that, right? Cool. Very good. I think we can stop at that. Well, I think the conclusion we're coming to, there are some interesting challenges with, with projects thinking. And Evan and I um, figured out through bitter and painful experience at, part, at times that maybe this wasn't a great way of working. So we wrote that book. Uh, and there's a few copies of it here. And you might guess that our premise is that projects suck. And there has to be a better way. It's it it's a little you subtle. You may not see that there, but yes, we, we, we're not the biggest fan of projects. <laughs> and a culture of continuous value. That's our premise. So this workshop, and it is a workshop. A workshop is a collaborative activity in which a group of people do work together. You will be doing work together. You will notice there is paper on the tables. There is 
pens, there are post-it notes and so forth. So if you're not up for workshop, please use the law of two feet. Okay, so everybody is committed. They are going to do work together. This is good. In this workshop, we're going to explore the why, the what, and the how of no projects. So, a, l a little bit of a history lesson. What exactly is a project? The PMI, the Project Management Institute, defines it as a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product, service, or result. Now, what word in there do you think that I take the most umbrage, that I have the most problem with? Exactly. And why? Why do we care about the word temporary? Shows lack of commitment. Why does it have to be continuous? Yes, sustainable. What else? They always continue anyway. Yes, absolutely. Now, there are some things where projects make sense. If you're building a road, when the road is finished, the people who build the road hand the road over to somebody else to maintain, and they go off and build another road. That makes perfect sense. How many of you build uh, knowledge worker products in your organization? Software or services of some sort? Marketing. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone here in the, ro in the road building industry? <laughs> or bridges. Or bridges. Bridges Houses. are good projects. Now th those are things where, where project does make sense. The temporary endeavor, that makes perfect sense. You can't add features to a bridge. Once that bridge is complete, it's done. You have, to, you have to invest money to maintain the value you've already created, but the maximum potential value has been created the minute the bridge is complete. You can add features to a bridge. It looks really weird and they normally fall down. Okay. So, in our world, in the world of knowledge work, everything that we do is continuous. It always has been, and this intention, and hang on, let me just go. Right? The, in, the expectation or the intention that we can stop is an artifact dating back, honestly, to about the 1960s, uh, as this sense of we want to create something that is predictable, repeatable, which is, and, and, and uh, who here knows what the software crisis was? Okay, history lesson, I apologize. I'm sure you weren't here for a history lesson, but I'm gonna give you one anyway. Chapter one of the book. <laughs> In the 1960s, there was a, a conference, the uh, Conference on Software Engineering, software engineering or something like yeah. that. It's where the, the first use of the word software engineering really came about. And the outcome, the premise of this conference and the outcome of this conference was that software was being disrespected. It was not being treated like engineering or the other professions. And so they wanted to professionalize the software. So they took engineering ideas and practices from building a bridge and they applied it to software. And everything that we have done since, we can trace back to that one, in our opinion, poor decision. Now, we have a problem, because fast forward to today, and everything about building a bridge does not apply to building project work. So number one, <laughs> number one, we focus on the wrong thing. Right? Who here is, uh, has written a project management plan before? Yep. Time, cost, scope. You put them in? Yes? In that plan, was there any mention of customer or value? No. You might have had benefits, right? Yep. Who measured it at the end? Did anyone measure it? Yeah, yeah, build the timesheets, absolutely. So, so I can say from personal Learning experience. Paper. <laughs> I spent so much time writing a, the, the, the benefits for a project and the only reason we wrote it was so that finance would release funds. And worse, the funds were already allocated. This was just a checkbox so that finance would release the funds. Not to get them, just to release them. So whose responsibility is it to track value after a project is complete? Hmm? No, the customer does not. Do, nope. 
Not according to any of this. According to PMI, according to PRINCE2, it is not the project manager's or the project responsibility to track value and value realization. Right? It the is project the project sponsor is supposed to be held to account. How many of you have done a benefits realization on a project? Doesn't happen. Oh, one oh, well, one there of were you. Two. There were two. <laughs> and were the benefits real? <laughs> <laughs> no, of course not. But it, it, yeah, it looks good. Yeah. So um, I used to be a public servant a long time ago, and we had a what we called the million dollar filing cabinet. So in Australian public service, you have these gates, right? and, and, and uh, to get funding to go to the next stage, you have to pass this, this gateway review. And there's all these documents you've got to provide to pass that gateway review, and they all got put in the filing cabinet and never taken out again. Uh, it's a million dollar filing cabinet because we spent that much money writing those documents, we never got that value back. Problem number two. Projects are temporary, products are not. Right? I can keep adding value to any knowledge worker product, no matter sort of who, where, when, anything that you're doing. Now, don't get me wrong, there is an end of life to a product. Products do end. Right? But the, the point at which we can stop adding value is far in excess of any project that you're running. Lastly, projects fail. No, they don't. They're just redefining the definition <laughs> of success. So I don't know about you, but um, I have read hundreds of articles, hundreds of scientific papers that look at failure rates. Now, depending on which one you read, it's anywhere from 20 to about 70 percent. Right? And here's a, let me flip the equation. Right? Let's say, for example, the Channel Tunnel, right? linking England and France. It yeah, was because of Brexit. Yeah, that's a different matter. It was over time, over price, and over budget. Is that a failure? Yes. If you're a project manager, it was. <laughs> yes. I, they have made a profit. It took a bit longer than they wanted, but they made a profit. Uh, is the project a failure? But time cost scope. What we measure in terms of project success is not necessarily the same. I've, I have actually managed by miracle to release products on time cost and scope and never realized the benefits. And did I get my bonus as a project manager? Yes, because all my responsibility was time cost and scope. Last one, I promise. Then we go get in, in, into the meat. Projects are expensive. Overheads. Overheads. Project managers. <laughs> Timesheets. Time All of the things that we do to fulfill some framework, to tick some boxes that. I was going to break into dance. That would have been horrifying. <laughs> that are done purely because there is a, a bureaucratic process that says we have to have this. And a lot of the, how many, how many wasted hours in you know, filling in those forms of yours, the million dollar filing cabinet, overruns, the, the project goes late, and we then spend thousands of person hours, or at least hundreds of person hours, Make it go quicker. We uh, explore, we, we, we dig into it, we, we scrape through the bones of it, really, and look for who we can blame. And what are we not doing? And the other thing about projects is we commit, typically, the full chunk of money at the beginning. Now, Agile has made this a little bit better. But even in the, in the Agile environment, with Agile software delivery, it's very, very uncommon that we will stop a project when we realize it's not actually going to deliver the thing that we expected. Because the funds have been allocated. The funds are allocated. They're already assigned. The budget is, is there. And there's probably somebody's bonus who depends on spending that money. And that somebody has got a level of authority in the organization, so they can just go ahead and continue. 
Now, now, are we being cynical? Are we being unfair? How do you feel? Unfair. Well, what are what are the benefits of projects? Mm -hmm. That is a very good consulting answer. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, here's the thing. It's not about the work. The work that we do is valuable. Yeah. Right? It's how we wrap the work. It's how we structure and govern the work. Yeah. Because the work is going to have to be done. So, let's go and introduce no projects. This idea that we can have continuous delivery of value to a customer, to an organization. Noting, yes, products end. Noting that... Uh, value is intangible at the beginning, it is an estimate. So we need a governance system, not a project, that allows us to go, are we doing the right thing? Are we doing it in the right way? And what does that look like? And are we still doing the right thing or should we stop doing this thing and refocus on something else? That's one of the, the most important characteristics of the no projects approach is when, we've, when we get to the point where we're wasting money, we stop. So we talk about outcomes over outputs. And let me ask you a question. If you're, if you're running a team and your business owner, product owner comes to you and say, we need to achieve this outcome. We need to improve staff satisfaction, let's say. And we're going to run a project. And that project's going to put fruit in every kitchen. All right, simple. Now. I have a budget, a million dollars for fruit. It's a lot of fruit. Now, a lot of people. A lot of people. If, as a project team, I have a better way of achieving that outcome versus delivering the work that was predefined in this project, should I be allowed or, in fact, encouraged to change what I do to achieve the same outcome? Yes. yes. Do we do that today? No, we don't. Right? We measure the wrong thing, time, cost, scope. We need to be measuring the business outcome. We need to be measuring the results continuously, not just at the end or not at all. What's it worth versus what does it cost? The project accounting only looks at cost. Benefits. Value delivered. So taking the, the fruit example, the, the employee satisfaction. What is, it, what is it worth to us as an organization to increase employee satisfaction? To reduce the attrition rates in the organization? To have more engaged people? Because you know what? We can actually measure the value of engaged employees in terms of uh, higher productivity. And we'll go into this in a bit of detail a bit later, but we need to run this maths. We need to know that it's going to cost us, uh, sorry, we need to know that it's worth a million dollars. And that gives us an ability to go, how much are we willing to spend? Right? Rather than the other way around of, it's going to cost us a million dollars, is it worth doing? It's the entire wrong way of, of looking at it. The other one that I do want to call out is this concept of t stable versus temporary teams. We all know the value of stable teams. We've seen the studies. We've seen um, the science behind it. Yet a project is, by definition, temporary. So the team comes together. They may have vendors and consultants as part of that team. And then they disband. And all that institutional and product knowledge is lost. And so we need a system of governance that allows us to retain that institutional change, uh, retain that product knowledge, and carry it forward in perpetuity. Stable does not mean static. Stable does not mean unchanging. Uh, it just means there is continuity. And that links to the cradle to grave accountability. And that's another, that, that gets a little bit hard as the, the team delivering a product, we're actually should be held to account for the value of that product in the marketplace. Not just build it and throw it over the wall. So we've, we've overcome silo-based thinking in software engineering and software development with Agile, we cross-functional teams. But now we're saying, let's do this 
on the broader overall product stream. An example, um, anyone here from Singapore? All right. Singapore Press Holdings. Um, are you from Singapore Press Holdings? No. Yes, good. Um, so uh, their developers made the, uh, the decision to go down to the MRT station right, with their latest product and just show people coming off the trains and go, what do you think? Right. Would you use this? Do you like it? Right? Rather than go through like this sense of I'm, we're just going to build whatever we're told, they went. We're going to take ownership of this product, and we're going to we not the marketing department, not the, the 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 a PR agency, an outsourced agency. We as developers are going to go and talk to people on the street and go, would you use our new product? And right? that kind of accountability you don't see. So, yes. Aha. That means what you build has to be good. You can't That's it. The people who build it maintain it. And they're not throwing it over the wall. So quality becomes an imperative from the beginning. And, and let's be absolutely clear. We do not distinguish build and run. Right? If you have continuous delivery, build is run. Right? The ability to continuously deploy something in the market is that it's out there. We're continuously improving it. All right, but that, that's that build, run, it's all the same thing, it's all the same team. Hmm? It, it's DevOps is an element. So DevOps is one implementation of the continuous mindset. But you can do DevOps with services. So, this is our definition of no projects. The alignment and cardinal sin of, of presenters is going to read off the slide. So I'm going to read off the slide. The alignment of activities to outcomes, activities being work, the stuff that you do to outcomes, the why that you do it. We need to know that what we're doing is for a purpose. Measured by value. Measurement is important. We need to know, we need to, if, if it's going to be aligned to an outcome, we've got to know, are we achieving a positive impact on that outcome, be it customer satisfaction or revenue or whatever it happens to be. Constrained by guiding principles. You can't do anything that you want. There's got to be a constraint. And optionally supported by CD technologies. And this is where the technology side of uh, no projects come in, where if you use a software space, we can deploy very quickly with the DevOps kind of technologies. But it doesn't have to be in that space. So let's just be clear. But if you're not in the software space, what, what can you do continuously? So the continuous mindset is vitally important. So, who here has control of budgets or finance? Or tr at least tracks budgets and finance? One, two, th some of you. This is a slide from Biat uh, Bognes, uh, Beyond Budgeting. This is looking at the fundamental difference between a project-based funding budget and a continuous-based um, um, budget. We are looking at the, we need to continuously measure, is our investment worth it? In a project space, we allocate the funds up front. They get assigned to a team, a team gets engaged, they start doing work, and then at the end, they deliver. Maybe they're over time, maybe they're over budget. Right? It is a project, so that's probably more likely than not. But the funds are allocated. We, you, you, you don't know if you've got the benefit until a long time after that team has disappeared. The difference is this continuous check. Are we okay? Are we getting a positive ROI? Now, we always expect that the, the first part of any piece of work is going to have a negative ROI. That's natural. Right? But beyond a certain point, we want, as long as there is a positive value, we can continue to invest in this work. And that's where that distinguishing factor comes in. We can stop this project, this product, the development, the team, at any point. It does not have to be waiting till the very end. And one of the key things about projects is 
we get to the end. And oh shucks, we haven't got enough money. Who's had a project overrun? Who hasn't? <laughs> what happens at that point? Yeah, we get into a game of chicken. The project manager goes to the steering committee and says, well, things are looking good. We're nine months into the 10-month project. So, uh, you know, green, 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 red. Yellow, yes, yes, yes. yes. No, 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 no. It, it, no. Never yellow. It's always green until red. Yeah, yeah watermelon projects, green on the outside, red on the inside. <laughs> We, but we, we, the, the conversation is sort of, we're close to the end, things are looking good. Just the, the, the evil testers, they found some bugs. We, 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 we're going to be a little bit late. So now we've got the $900,000 that we've spent of the million dollar budget. Um, we only need another 300000 <laughs> So really, and the, the choice for the steering committee is give us another 300000 or write off your total investment. And this is the sunk cost fallacy. Yeah. So what happens when well, we get the $300,000 and the project manager goes away and now on month 13 they come back, um, now it has gone red. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, sorry, the evil testers, they found more bugs. We need another 400000 and the game of chicken continues again because now we are um, $1.3 million down or give me another 400,000. And we get the 400,000 and the average project is 172% of budget. And it, it, it's in the other side as well, all right? What happens, it's October, all right? The CFO asks for all project uh, proposals for the next financial year. You put in that proposal for $2 million. What does the CFO give you? One million, yeah. all right? So, so it, 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 it's this chicken and mouse. The CFO knows that your numbers are made up you know your numbers are made up, and yet there's suddenly a surprise when it doesn't work out the way you expected. So, how do you solve this? Um, go back. How, from a finance perspective, right? What's the easiest thing that you can do tomorrow to make just a small difference behind all of this? A capacity-based working model is great, but that's going to take you some time. All right? Lean budgeting, great, still going to take you some time. Tomorrow morning, you're going to go to your office. What's one thing that you could do tomorrow just to get started? Start measuring the right thing, absolutely. But how about this? Go have a conversation with your CFO. Seriously. All right? We kind of have this antagonistic relationship with finance in many cases. Right? This us first them, I, I, they hold the purse strings, you're, we're sort of scared of them. Right? Or we hate them because they're not allowing us to do our job. And yet somehow we forget that they're people, they actually want us to succeed, right? but that, that, that lack of respect goes both ways. So just start by having a conversation, understand why did you cut our budget by 50% at the beginning? You knew we were going to ask for more money. Right? So go just start make friends with the CFO. They will be your, your biggest ally in anything that you do. Yeah, continuous. So that concept of the continuous flow of value rather than these big chunks of delivery. And in the IT space today, DevOps should be a given. It is just this should be the way that we build products. But we can do this, this, con this concept of continuous marketing, continuous feedback, continuous financing. And that, that is, that's this. Small incremental pieces of value that we can validate, we can get feedback, we can change direction. It gives us the, the opportunity and the courage to change direction. So, another question for you. <coughs> Why do we want a continuous business? It's harder. 
it's certainly less predictable. Why do we want continuous everything in our organization? Okay, those are great answers. Let me go. There we go. Yours, great answer, but deeper, one level deeper is because the customer expects us to be continuous now. Our customer expectation of value, our customer's expectation of change requires us to keep up. Because if we don't, our competitors will. And looking at value versus velocity. So this, the, how many of you use story points as a way of measuring velocity in, in the organization? So yeah, common thing. And your, your story point graph looks something like this. No, we, the, the first few iterations, sprints, whatever, we, we're getting something, but really mm, now we get to a point where we have the, the MVP, the minimum viable product, and maybe we've uh, released it and we're, we're, we're starting to get some real value. And now, uh, actually, no, sorry, that's, that's the story point graph, that's the velocity graph, one by one, but the value, first few iterations, MVP, we're starting to get some, some return. We're getting the so must-haves, should-haves, and things are looking really good. Customers are liking the product, but now we're starting to, uh, to get into here, and value is starting to flatten out. Um, if I've got a budget for the project, I'm going to go to here. If I'm the project manager incentivized on time, on budget, on scope, I'm going to go to here. On the other hand, if we can look at value and say, you know what, there's a, there's a few stories in the backlog, they're, they, they're really cool, but nobody really actually wants them. What if we stopped here? What if we saved these iterations worth of effort and moved a different stream of work to this team? Or maybe it's now the, the next release of that product, which has a very different backlog. A new S curve, and our product should be a series of S curves. And the 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 art of product management is knowing when the S curve is flattening. So then, how do we at that point to determine so the value that we have for the product? So customer feedback, real feedback. Yeah. So we're measuring the impact of the work that we do. So let me. We're going to get, I'll come back to this slide because I want to get this in a second. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to those. So that's a very good question. That takes us actually to the first exercise that we're going to do. So there is a concept that you need to understand, which is around outcomes over outputs. Right? Now, this means we need to know what is a business outcome. We need to know why we're doing the work that we do. And the problem with most projects is the distance between the work and the outcome is very great. All right. So what we're going to introduce you to is to a little tool that we use called an outcome profile. All right. This is a very simple way of clearly articulating why you're doing something. So we are going to build one of these in a group, but l let's do one together. So. Who is running a project right now? Fantastic. Sunita, tell me, what is your project? We are developing a product for a merchandise planning domain. Explain. What is a merchandise planning domain? Explain for everybody. It's for the, for the planner and buyer to plan for the merchandise and, and forecast and learn from the, the you know, from do data analytics. <coughs> Okay. So, data analytics, um, a, a planning system, forecasting system for purchasing merchandise. Right? For retail stores. For retail store. Yeah. Fantastic. So, who here knows the, uh, the, 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 the lean concept called five whys? Yeah. So, five whys is usually used for root cause analysis. Where we have a problem, we want to go, okay, like, what's the root cause behind this? And it's like, why, 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 why? It's annoying when my six-year-old does it. It's really annoying when an agile coach does it. But it's still a good and important tool. So 
let, we're going to repurpose five whys. We're going to create a root outcome analysis. So, Sunita, you're building this merchandise planning tool. Why? Because the customer, the market, the market is competitive. The customer wants it. It's uh, one of the hot seller in the market. That's what our product managers say. Okay, so it's a hot seller. Yeah. Right? The customer wants it. Why do they want it? So that they can do their uh, planning better and make money. They can get more business value. Okay. So, so, so if they can plan better, what's the outcome of that? Uh, making more prof profit. Okay. So. Making more profit. Let me pause for a second and just talk about outcomes. Why are you in business? Are you in business to make money? You are an amazing person. <laughs> but he's also right. He's also right. Maybe not so quite so flowery as that. Right? But you are not in business to make money. Let me say that again because it's controversial. Correct. You are in business for your customer. You are in business to create something of value for your customer. We still need to make a profit. Right? And Frederick Laluse, I think, said, said it best in his book, Reinventing Organizations, when he said, profit is like the air. We do not um, live to breathe, but we do need to breathe in order to live. Right? So I don't become a doctor uh, to make money. I become a doctor to save lives, right? at least if I'm a good doctor. Um, however, as a do I still need to make money so I can continue saving lives. So. When you're doing your sort of root outcome analysis, when you get to, to make money, you've gone one step too far. Go back up a step. Because right? the purpose isn't to make money, unless you're like a hedge fund. Right? Your purpose is because your customers need to plan better. That is why. Right? Sorry, I was talking about the customer's purpose. Yeah, no, no, no. So, no, no. Yes. To help make customer money was. <laughs> but, but your customer's purpose is to plan better. If you sold them a product that let them plan, plan better, have you been successful? Your purpose is ultimately your customer's purpose. Let's be clear. So your outcome for your, for your product is right, better planning. Now, this here is what we call a vivid descriptor. It's a paragraph that describes the outcome. So we have a couple of words, right? better planning. Very good. We want to articulate a little bit more about that. So uh, it's used often in, say, vision statements and mission statements, but we use vivid descriptors here to describe an outcome. I'll give you an example. The Ford Motor Company, back in 1902-1903, set a, sort of a vision to democratize the automobile. Right? That was their outcome. But then they set these vivid descriptors that explained what they meant. And it was, I'm doing this from memory, so it wasn't these exact words, but along the lines of, we see a future in which no man, this was the 1900s, I'm sorry, on good salary cannot afford a, a car to enjoy God's green earth, or words to that effect. So the vivid descriptor explains the outcome in a language that allows us to very clearly and emotively understand it. Now, an outcome is useless without a measure. Right? I need to know how are we helping our customers plan better. So for this, we have a number of measures. So the first of all, right? uh, this is a slightly old version. Uh, so the first of all, how are you going to measure planning better? Or how do they measure? Okay, so, 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 so um, let me say, I, I'm not sure, maybe, maybe not increase sales, let's for example say reduce inventory, all right? So, in, so inventory size is a measure, all right? The baseline, all right? What's their inventory today, all right? Let's say it's 1,000 units for the sake of uh, conversation. Then we have a target, all right? If you can better plan, what should that inventory be? 
Just in time, zero. All right, let's say uh, no, zero, zero is too far. Let's say 10 units. All right, you've got to have a little bit of stock. All right, so, we've re so our goal here as a product is to reduce by uh, 1,000 to 100. 190. So 99% reduction in inventory. That would be a huge success. That doesn't mean version one gives us a 99% increase in that, right? but it means that that's what we're working towards and that's what we're going to measure. Now, how often would you measure that? Every quarter. Every quarter. Aha. As needed. As needed. No. So, so no. good guess. <laughs> All right. So, let me explain about cadence. Cadence is how often you measure something. Now, if you can measure something automatically with no input, right, then the cadence of measure could be daily. Right? But there is a cost to measurement. For example, uh, the example up here, uh, staff satisfaction. Uh, oh no, that's a retention. Uh, let's say your customer satisfaction survey was a measure. You can't run a survey every day with people. The act of measurement would actually decrease your customer satisfaction. So, Tell me how happy you are now. <laughs> <laughs> and tomorrow. And the next day. No. So, not going to happen. Right? Now, you put a smiley face, sad face, like they do in Singapore immigration, as you walk out the turnstiles at work, I might be able to get daily measurement as they walk out. Right? So there's, there's different ways that you could change the measurement. So, so the question is, if you had an automated information from some sort of uh, CRM or stock control system that said their inventory was today X, then you could, you could measure that on a day-by-day -day basis. Right? If, however, it was a, hey, customer X, how, how's your inventory go going? In that case, yes, we are talking about a monthly or, or, or quarterly measure. Now, here's the other thing. The longer the measurement cycle, let me go backwards, sorry. This. The longer the measurement cycle, the slower it is for you to make a decision and to in inspect and adapt. All right. So shorter measurement cycles are better as long as the act of measurement does not impede or impact on the work that you're trying to do. Understood? So in the case of stock control, if it's manual, let's say it was monthly. All right. There's things like dependencies and ownership and all that sort of thing, but we're not going to worry about that for this example. So do you understand? Five whys to get to the root outcome, and then we need to know how we're going to measure it. And in fact, we can have multiple measures per outcomes. And also, similarly, with five whys, we can have multiple outcomes for any given project. But here's what we're going to do. I need, we need you to break into teams of six. Six-ish. So tables, groups. So each table will have two groups and other groups around. Grab a piece of paper. So each group, uh, just pause for a second, don't start just yet. Right? Each group, pick one person, one project in that group. It doesn't matter which one, and that person is sort of, it, it, sort of the, 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 the host. Everyone else's job is to sort of interrogate, to find out, learn about their project. If your project is commercial in confidence, don't volunteer. Right? <laughs> so everyone around you, learn about that project, and then ask them those five whys. Why is it? And remembering, if you get some money, you've gone too far. Right? Now, if you find that it's unclear, if, it's not, if it doesn't have a clear outcome, right, then for the sake of this exercise, skip it and pick another one. Right? Um, but in the real world, if the outcome is unclear, you probably don't want to do that project. Yeah. But for the sake of the exercise, because we do want to go through and build this outcome profile. <laughs> All right. So, so does everyone understand what we're asking them to do? All right. It, um, make sure you have one of the big pieces of paper. Right, pick that topic. We want the outcome. You don't have to write the vivid descriptors if you don't want to. We need the measure. Yeah, group we need the baseline. Six people, so each table will split into two, and you might get some some of the the stragglers, the the hanger-ons around.
Yeah, so pick one person who is going to be, who's actually doing a project. Yes, so uh, uh, honestly, Riley, we're not making a the dent patient, in the market at that point of time. Uh, and uh, so, so it is a generic drug. For example, so it was a customer with the voice of the customer. Uh, uh, so uh, so uh, uh, no. Okay. Uh, she was explaining the It will be easier to maintain, easier to roll out changes with multiple platforms. So what would success look like is what I am understanding. So before even building the product, we go and have a Okay, so at the back there. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Right. So in our case the outcome the project first. So let's let's talk about the project. So this project is about uh, delivering uh, best, better customer-made uh, furniture uh, made as per requirements for conservative people. So that's a basic vivid description of what it is. And uh, we have got a baseline measure that we will be using NPS. Our target would be between uh, you know, 9 and 10 that we need to have. Our measurement would be with every order and the cadence of uh, keeping track of would be monthly. All right. So, improving the experience when people are buying furniture. Who else? Yeah, so we have done the five eyes on the project. So, we are calling this project one. Uh, the main outcome of this is to basically reduce time for publishing scientific content. And uh, the first why was basically, why are we doing this? So, the answer was increase publications count. And why do we want to increase the publications count? To have an increase in the market share. And why do we want to increase the market share? So the company is already a market leader in this particular domain. So it needs to maintain its market leadership. Now the question is, why do we want to increase, uh, maintain the market leadership? Because uh, it would attract more researchers to come up with their publications, attract more researchers, and sustainability is a factor. And at the end of the day, why is this matter? It's basically profits. So it's a, it's annual. The number of publications is annual, so okay. the numbers are huge. Mm -hmm. So so okay. So the measure is number of um, number of publications. You obviously have a baseline number, which is a thousand, and a target number, which is two thousand, or whatever those numbers happen to be. And you're measuring now. Measuring annually is a bad idea because you can only change annually. So you'd probably want to measure per publication. Okay. Um, probably we have a doubt we when we're doing this exercise. Uh, actually, we were uh, doing in terms of outcome. So we were actually thinking whether it is an outcome or a goal. So what is the kind of difference between an outcome and a goal? Because we wanted to say like we wanted to put more publications by or reduce the number of manuscript uh, effort by 85% or something. So we, we were a little confused between whether it is a goal or an outcome. Outcome, objective, goal, direction. There's a benefits. There's a num a lot of different words that have very similar meanings. So, if you to keep it simple for the time being, whether you call it an outcome or something else, if it is measurable and has a business advantage, then that's what we are calling an outcome. If it is uh, inspiring a direction where we want the entire company going in that direction, but, is that, but we may not necessarily measure what that is, then that's a goal or a vision. 
Right? So one is meant for communication and inspiration. One is meant for measurement and decision making. Does that make sense? And a rose by any other name. I don't care what you call it. Different organizations call them outcomes or objectives so I've heard, or benefits. Uh, it could be a goal. It's different matters, right? But it's measurable, right? And it is, and deci governance decisions are made based on this information. That's the, those are the characteristics, whatever you happen to call it. Okay, so this is really hard. And back in my consulting days, um, we would run these exercises with rooms full of business executives from a company, and we could spend an entire day just trying to get them to understand why they were in business. These are the owners of the companies struggling to understand who their customer was and why they existed. And this is part of the problem. We, we get so sunk into this idea of the work that we do that we lose sight of why we do the work. Right? This concept of, sort of value over busy. Anyone heard of Dude's Law before? <laughs> the late Dave, Hus Dave Hussman was the dude. And he gave us this really simple formula, which is incredibly difficult to actually apply in organizations. Value is why divided by how. The why is that outcome benefit, the why we are doing this. How is what do we need to do to do it? the activities, the, the sum cost of the work to achieve it. And defining value is always hard. But if we don't define value, then we have no way of truly setting direction in the products that we are building. And we'll skim over that one, and we'll think about how do we break this work down? What are the activities that we need to do. You could use user stories, you could use story mapping, but I'm going to work on the, on the premise that everyone here is, is familiar with story mapping, right? And user stories, so we're not going to teach you how to do user stories. When some versions of this workshop, some audiences, we do have to because they haven't come across it. But a, te a tool, a technique that, that is in the book, is the, the activity canvas. So let's be clear. The work that you do, the value creating work inside a project or inside any other governance structure is the same. We're not telling you that there's a better way of being a better developer right? or a better way of selling custom furniture. What we are saying is that the governance structure around it, we can have better, more effective, more efficient. So, so we, we work from the premise that, you, that technical excellence is your baseline in the way that you do work. So no what that work is. Yeah. Let's think about the work that you do. We have a continuous flow of work. Right? Now, here's the challenge. If I'm building a project, whether it's an agile project or a non-agile project, doesn't matter. I have a work breakdown structure. I have a, a scope because it's fixed time, fixed scope. I'm, I don't define, if it's agile, I don't define the user stories up front, but I still know what I'm doing, the high level scope, and, and the rough order I'm doing it. However, we now have a continuous flow, a stable team that's gonna stay together, not for three months, but for 12 months. And they're gonna work on something. And that something is gonna achieve an outcome. And they're going to achieve the highest value outcome they possibly can. And they're going to make decisions on a day-by-day -day basis as to which work is going to have the maximal impact on the outcome. And if they may, when I get started, I don't know what that work is. I ha all I know is what work am I going to do today? What's the best work I'm going to do today? So... We developed this concept called an activity canvas. It is very simple. You've probably seen things like this before in different um, forms or different structures. This is a form of prioritization, a form of value and value sense making. <coughs> right? There are, it's two axes. 
value and effort. Quadrant one, do. These are high value, low effort. Do them as quickly as you can, as early as you can. Defer, high value, high effort. Still important to do, but do them later. Right? Don't do them straight away. Limit, low value, low effort. If you have time, sure, pick one or two of them, get them done. Right? And, and, and uh, actually, I'll come back to that. And then avoid, low value, high effort. These are things which, honestly, you shouldn't be doing. Now, but Evan, right? why would I put anything in a void? Because this is an active tool. Something that today is high value, sorry, that, that's low value and high effort, over time might become more important. Right? Suddenly the CEO of your customer is asking for this feature, suddenly that's a lot more important than it was yesterday. Or we've built a lot of the un underpinning technology. So now, you know what? It's no longer a three month piece of work, it's now a two day piece of work. So it's now low effort. So whatever's in this board is going to change. Dependencies and, and, uh, and reprioritization, changes of expectation from the customer. Whatever changes, this is how we're gonna track it. And let's be clear, the status quo, not doing anything is the easiest possible thing that you can do. Right? There's no value in doing nothing. In fact, there's negative value in doing nothing, but that's a more complicated discussion. Right? And it, of course, takes no effort. So the status quo, let's be honest, is an option. And there will come a point when that is the best option. And that is the point at which you stop work. It's when there is nothing left that is valuable to be done. Right? And the status quo is where, where you want to stay. Now, yes? Between defer and limit, which one should go first? Give me a second and I will answer that question. Um, the upcoming uh, box we put on the side, because this is an active tool, everything that's in these quadrants, you could take any one of these and start working on it today. Upcoming are things that we need to plan for in the future, but we can't do. All right? so, so think of it in terms of um, uh, your definition of ready. Anything that meets your definition of ready sits on the board. Anything that's not ready because it's got a critical dependency or because from a time, it, it's, it's, we need to wait till after the financial year or after some particular point in time before we can do it, sits, we don't want to lose it, so it sits in the upcoming box. Yep. Now, two other characteristics to be aware of. Can you go next? Oop, next, there we go. Order. The ideal order is top left down to bottom right. Now, we're going to weave back and forth across there. All right. Two things which are equal, flip a coin. It doesn't matter. All right. it, it really doesn't matter which one you do first. Two thing, if something's not equal, then it tells you where to go, which one to go first. Now, this requires an architecture for your system, whether it's te technological or not, that allows for that modular design. But if we're talking DevOps, if we're talking uh, microservices, we've already got the architecture, we have those patterns in place, we're not gonna go into those details. If we're talking, say, marketing, uh, and a marketing uh, uh, camp series of campaigns, then we have systems in place, agile marketing practices that allow us to do continuous marketing versus of the, the project-based marketing. So it doesn't really matter what work you're doing, as long as you've got the business architecture in place to do the highest value, lowest effort work first. But we don't always, because this is business. And sometimes we have to do things that aren't optimum first. Right? We have a key resource, because of course we don't call them people in business, 
right? We call uh, a key person, a, a, key, a key piece of talent that we've only got for two weeks. So we're going to do anything with that person that we need to in those two weeks. We're not going to, they may not be the most valuable, but we're still going to do it because common sense tells us we're going to do it first. Or it might be a due date. Right? It's got to be done by the end of the financial year. Right? Or it's got to be done before some key milestone. So we do that one first. So we can break and go, we're going to do this, and then we're going to go, and we're going to go top left to bottom right. So common, this is a way of checking and validating the work that you're doing without losing common sense. Make sense? Yeah, simple. So let's do this. Yeah. Ah, yeah, no, sorry, sorry, that's a very good question. So business value. Let's talk about effort for a second. Who estimates effort? Anyone disagree with that? Good. <laughs> yes, the team estimates effort. Who estimates value? And, and remember, this is an estimate of value. We don't know for sure how much value until after it's done. Not the team. Customer. At the end, it's the customer or the product owner as the customer's proxy. Okay? So, we want during sort of regular planning, whatever engagement, let's say we're using Scrum as a, as a wrapper for some of this, then during that planning session, during the, when the product backlog is being built, the customer or the product owner estimates the value, the team estimates the effort. Uh, and I'm going to challenge that those are not customer centric. As a customer, I care about security. I care about performance. As the customer surrogate, the uh, product owner must be able to say, yeah, I can distinguish between the, the value to the organization of putting in a security framework versus a performance, uh, uh, performance elements of the product. So, and, and if truly it has no customer value, don't do it. Yeah. Uh, the question is like, uh, if the business value gets rescoped or get the scope gets widened, uh, whether it is from the product owner or from the customer side, uh, then the impact will be on the estimated effort. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, how do we manage that first question? And second, where do we put this? I mean, in the do differ or in we the... We move it around. We move it around. So, we thought it was low effort, high business value. Oh, shucks, we've done a little bit of exploration. <gasps> That's really high effort. <coughs> business value is still high. So, now we've got to have the conversation. Do we do this next? Or do we do that one next? And, and doing the only decision I need to make with this tool is what do I do next? And top left, that's what I do next. Obviously, common sense applies. Um, the other element of this is around how do we, uh, when we're tracking every Every day we're going, okay, what's the next thing we do? How are we going to do it? Who's going to do it? Right? As an active tool, put this on the board, post it notes, track it regularly. And there's going to be things on there that will come off. As an idea that's on the board and never gets done. And that's okay. Because we, we are a single, stable team. We're going to keep working on these activities towards an outcome. We're going to measure that outcome every, in the case of um, uh, better planning, every month. And every single one of these activities will have an imperceptible value. So here's the thing, we don't measure value per activity. Right? We say this is more valuable than this, and it's, it's all, by the way, it's all relative estimation. I don't say this has X value, all I care about is it's more valuable. That's really all I care about. So in the case of, of better planning, every month, how are we, what's the inventory? Is it less than it was last month? 
great. We are on trend. I don't even care about numbers, I care about trends. So every month, I want the inventory to go down, 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 down. That's my goal. Right. In the case of um, uh, the work, if the trend starts going up, then as a team, I have a decision to make. Do I change the direction, take all the stuff off and go, okay, strategic plan. We have an outcome of reducing inventory, we're not doing that, Let's change. Or two, do we change team members? Maybe we don't have the right skills in the team. Maybe we need some, a supply chain expert in the team as well. So we'll evolve the team. Option three, maybe we've actually reached an end. The target of 99% was never achievable in any imagination. Maybe we hit 80% and then plateaued. Let's leave it there. Is that good enough? Great. Now let's repurpose and let's build the next product or the next thing, and that's the end. So we're always tracking that trend, and we're always, this is just to go, what's next? Make sense? Question. Yes. So how often do we uh, update or refine this canvas? Constantly. As often as is needed. Uh, like with all governance, any, any governance that you have will have an imposition of time and effort. So, so if your work operates on a daily basis, this could replace your Kanban board or the, the backlog column on your Kanban board and it's just something you update on a, during a daily stand-up or a planning session on a week or at the beginning of a sprint. Just Hang on, him first. You want to come to. <coughs> For every backlog item, do you mean to say that we put it over here in each of these, one of these four quadrants and then look at value versus effort? Is that what it is? Or yes. Yeah. So oh. then, uh, my concern was around the backlog is always uh, evolving. Very good. Yeah. So, so a lot of it will be in that, here. I would say more by ethics. And these are the... Oh, yeah, no, so, sorry. This is, th these aren't stories. Yeah, yeah. These are epics. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Big chunks. Suppose if you were to make it actually story and use it as a pre as a prioritization before the Kanban, would that be a good idea to do? At that level, so so in think of it in terms of when you're doing measurement, all right. So so every you have a weekly sprint, for example, yeah. all right. You know you're going to do ten different. Your velocity says I can do ten story points per sprint or a hundred story points per sprint, whatever number it happens to be. All right. Doesn't matter if you're not measuring the out the impact on the outcome until the end of the sprint. And uh, does it matter what order you do the stuff in that sprint? No. So, so overloading your sort of prioritization in the sprint, is, it's, it's more effort than it's worth. Not in the sprint, actually before the Even before the sprint, because the order of which you do it in the sprint doesn't matter. That's true, but that's why we're doing it at the, at the, higher, at the higher level. If it makes sense in your context to do it in the sprint, or before the sprint, go ahead. But in my experience, doing it that frequently is actually more effort than the value of that governance. Yeah, just a just a timing point, folks. We have been told we can go, we can carry on in the space until five o'clock because the uh, talk that was going to come after it has been cancelled. That speaker's wife is ill, and they've had to leave. Um, so up to you if we want to carry on until five o'clock and do the next activity. Otherwise, we've got five minutes left. Yep. Just yeah, one yeah. last question. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, really, uh, trying to understand your rationale around uh, value is very clear, right? Why are we bringing estimated effort with respect to time driven? This are we anything like a sprint goal or something? Because and and no point are we saying how to estimate. So, so, uh, so some of these conversations I think we can take a little bit afterwards, but I will say all we need to know is the order. Highest value, lowest effort first. I don't need to know how much effort, I don't need to estimate, I don't need to know if it's going to take one day or one week. That's where I'm kind of struggling even because uh, in the complex adaptive system, well, when you deal with unknown, the effort is always uh, some number to begin with. That in itself is not a great uh, starting point. So when you do your forecasting just with that mere number, 
So, just to add, mm. since these efforts are relative to whatever items that are coming, yeah. so it will take care of Thank you. Uh, those different. So, let's take a pause. All right, uh, too many questions for a second. Sorry, I will come back. So, let's do this. We're going to spend five minutes. I want you, before, just on, on that paper, take this um, outcome. On the post-it notes in front of you, I want you to create 10 activities. Make them up, right? Just 10 epics, big picture things that you're going to create. Put them just on a sheet of paper, don't order them yet. Once you've got the 10, draw this quadrant, right? Effort, effort and value. The person whose project it is, right? Estimate based, and th this is purely for the sake of practice, so it's not perfect. Look at how much you think it's going to take relative to everything else. Which are the easiest and which are the most valuable? And put them on that quadrant. It really is just that relative to. Taking one product would be more sensible, right? Rather than multi product. Yeah. Yeah, it's within, it's within the bounds of a, of a single stream of work. One activity canvas per outcome. Yep, whichever works for you. Put them in the axis. If you got six, use six. We, how, how easy is this? Mm, deciding on the business value is hard. Deciding on the effort is hard. You know what? It's hard. And that's one of the, and it generates the discussion. A lot of discussion, and that's exactly what we want. <laughs> yeah, and that is exactly what we want, because what is happening is we're exposing uncertainties and unknowns, and we're forcing us to go and explore deeper and get answers. So if something is up in the high business value, high, co high effort, we're saying defer, but we really want to do that. What can we do to slice it, to move it to lower effort, for instance? What's the smallest piece? There's likely to be a lot of uncertainty in that. And so it goes on. I have a question here. Yeah. So the, we, we, we can have like, you know, something that's of high value, yeah. but it is required. Okay. Yeah. yeah. High so effort, high value. High value to take. So it cannot be actually be something that is deferred. It's required. It's a dependency unless we have that. Yeah. Then do it first. Then do it. That's where the common sense comes in. Yeah. So, so, okay. Let me close this off. Yeah. All right. So, what do we have? We have not a project. We have a continuous flow, a continuous delivery of value, which means we have a stable team. One team, seven plus or minus two people, or two teams, or ten teams, doesn't matter. For the sake, let's say it's one team. We have a team. They stay together. The membership might change, new people might come in, right? But the knowledge of that product stays. We have a product, right? We have an outcome. We know that this team is accountable for an outcome. That team is accountable to achieve a reduction in inventory. They are accountable to achieve improved NPS in terms of buying furniture. Right? They have a reason for existing, and that reason isn't to do work. That reason is to achieve an outcome. The team, we measure the outcome monthly, daily, not yearly, that's a bad example. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, per publication. Doesn't really matter how, but we measure the outcome. We have a CFO 
who is looking at those measurements and, and, and there is a, a leadership team in conjunction with this team going, are you doing the right thing? Is the trend of that outcome positive? Is um, uh, inventory going down month on month? Is NPS going up uh, delivery by delivery? Is publication numbers going up uh, uh, month by month? Right? We're checking. And if the answer is no, right, we make a decision. Change, stop, continue. Con and, that, and we're looking at that measure all the time. Are we making an impact? And remember the S-curve? You're not going to make an impact on the outcome at the beginning. We know this. The CFO knows this. But at a certain point, that's when we go. Are you still doing the right thing? And then, as a team, we need to decide what is the right thing. What is the next thing we need to do? What is the thing we do after that, and after that, and after that? And then at a certain point, we have built a governance system that allows us to create value continuously with limited management input. I have the decision and authority rights to go or stop depending on how the business outcome is going. And at no point have I created a project management plan. At no point am I measuring time, cost, or scope. And at no point do I stop because an arbitrary budget point has been reached. Right? I stop when the value is ended. I continue while there is value. I deliver the most valuable work that I possibly can, regardless of what I thought was valuable 12 months ago. And our customer is happy. It's our customer who will come back because it's who we're doing this for. We're going to stop this here. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions, but we'll, we'll shut this down. And if you have any questions, please come and have a conversation. Um, what was the toughest question we got today? Oh, yes. Oh, who, uh, that, that was a... That was definitely worth... So what was the, what was the, the toughest question we got? Oh, I don't know. That's that the tough toughest question. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some good answers. <laughs> and, and, no, and I think Fems was an excellent answer. And Raj for the, uh, society, a good answer. So thank you very much, everyone. Feel free to come and ask any questions later if you need. Thank you. Yes. Fire away. We want to treat the vendor as part of the team. So the relationship changes from a confrontational to a collaborative team. And, and one of the things that I want in my vendor engagement is I want the, the, the vendor people to be as stable as the customer people. Mm. Yeah. And now you, and then you, you're setting yourself up to lose a huge amount of institutional knowledge, and that's the realities. So the the behaviours that we see in the marketplace drive value out of businesses. And maybe it's time we stop stop behaving like that. <laughs> yeah, and treat your vendor as people who are part of your stable team. And if you and what we do see, there are contracting models and procurement models that that do result in better alignment. It does happen. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much. So there's no answer. Like, it, it depends answer, right? But I know companies who organize by customer experience.